today we have a very special interview with Dr. Simon Woodruff. Simon is the founder of Woodruff Scientific, which has been around since 2005, and a co-founder of Compact Fusion Systems. Simon is going to be talking about the challenges with commercializing fusion and the advantages of the reactor design pursued by Compact. Enjoy. Uh, so the first question is, can you introduce yourself to people who don't know who you are? My name's Simon Woodruff. I'm the president of Woodruff Scientific. Uh, we're an outsourced R&D company, uh, initially serving the fusion energy sciences community. We've been in business for about 14 years. And our, our mission has been to accelerate the development of commercial fusion energy systems. And we've been doing this by working on everything from pulse power systems, diagnostic simulation, all the way through to advanced costing analysis. Uh, we're currently a team of, of seven, two, H, two PhDs, two BSCs, two BNGs, and uh, one MBA. And uh, we've got scientific advisors and collaborators throughout the, uh, the fusion scientific community. Uh, we're headquartered in, in Santa Fe at the Santa Fe Business Incubator. And uh, there we benefit from the council of a team of uh, expert uh, uh, and seasoned business types. And we've just opened a lab in Santa Fe and we are, we're offering products and services in the fusion energy sciences community and beyond. So when did you personally first get interested in fusion? I've always been interested in uh, man's impact on the environment. And from an early age, I traveled to the Center for Alternative Technology in, in Wales. And there I learned about solar and wind and efforts to improve energy efficiency and how to build buildings more efficiently and so on. But at school, I got interested in astronomy and physics. And it really wasn't until I came out the end of an astrophysics degree that I got to thinking about how I could use what I'd learned and use that training and that knowledge to have an impact. And, that, and that's when I, I really first started thinking about fusion. The astrophysics covers a lot of the, the same physics that used in fusion, the plasmas, spectroscopy, power balances, and then studying stellar evolution. Fusion is uh, an integral part of that. You know, so I came out at the end of a BSc and I had to make a decision about further study. And I, I picked fusion as a, as a logical next step and I applied to grad school at uh, the University of Manchester uh, Institute of Science and Technology. And there, there I had the opportunity to work on a small fusion system at the end of the PhD. I was invited to the Lawrence Livermore National Lab, where they were building a very similar system to the one I did my PhD on. So really there wasn't any fusion aha moment. It was just a very gradual evolution and only thinking a year or two ahead as I evolved my interests um, during uh, my studies. But then in, in 2005, you founded Woodruff Scientific and you've been able to make this business inside a very small niche. How have you managed to do that? Because uh, there are many people that would love to know how that's possible. <laughs> I'd say the primary thing is that we've worked super hard. We've, we've been really lucky too. Early on, we won a couple of small business innovation research grants from the Department of Energy. And those uh, helped us develop a range of products and services in pulse power, magnets and diagnostics, and also in simulations. And since then, we've been offering those to a wider scientific community as custom solutions. You know, it's a great privilege to have a couple of contracts for fusion related matters, but most of our contracts are not fusion related. We work under contract to the private sector, universities and national labs. You know, about 14 years in now, we've got the formula about, right, we're about to get our ISO 9000 certification, and this will provide a much higher level of quality assurance for everything leaving our lab. We found niches in, in custom magnets, pulse power systems, diagnostics and simulation support. We've offered training in high performance computing. And, and simulations and this is something we do maybe once a year and it's offered for free to graduate students and un undergrads as a, as a week-long training event and we do that as a company just to keep our tools sharp there is a burgeoning fusion industry really excited to see others entering this space and looking to accelerate the development of fusion energy systems i mean this is this is what gets me out of bed in the morning so I thought we can do this collaboratively. Most fusion startups want to do things in-house and, and understandably, uh, you know, intellectual property is a bit of a minefield and having capabilities in-house allows the company to generate trade secrets and know-how. And these are also valuable IP. 
We're super keen to help fusion organizations reach their goals and happy to be sensitive to non-disclosure agreements and IP agreements. In fact, most of what we do is under NDA. You guys have a lot of scientific talent, and as this industry gets going, I think you guys are going to be very valuable in terms of what you can do for these other companies and investors. So you have two other companies. Can you <laughs> briefly describe each one of these companies? They're both in a nascent stage. I mean, we're spinning out two companies from Woodruff Scientific. And the, the first is SciVista, which is, data, which is a data visualization company. And, and the second is Compact Fusion Systems, or, or Compact, just to differentiate ourselves from the other CFS or, or Commonwealth uh, Fusion Systems. So SciVista is our data viz company, and we've developed a collaborative uh, virtual reality data visualization platform. Uh, and this currently interfaces with Paraview, one of the leading data viz packages for big scientific data set. And our aim for SciVista is to be like a Skype or a Zoom for collaborative data viz. We, we found seed investment last year and we won an SBIR phase one to support this development, uh, specifically for fusion applications. And we're working with some of the leading fusion organizations around the world to put simulation and experimental data into the context of CAD. You know, if you have a CAD of an experiment, you want to see your data overlaid either from simulations or from the experiment. And so that's, that's where SciVista is coming from. We're, we're getting interest from further afield from the Air Force, from medical imaging companies and, and so on. But it's 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 a pretty exciting piece of technology. VR tech has come along a lot a long way recently. Yeah, it's just super cool to see. For example, for the medical imaging, um, we can see a, an image of a brain, and you can you can scale that, you can slice it, you can um, uh, rotate it, and 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 share that information with um, with with collaborators as as if they are present. That's coming along. It's almost commercial. So we have a minimally viable product and something we could get out the door and sell tomorrow. So for Compact, we started this discussion in, uh, in 2012, and this was motivated by angels and advisors, and they really wanted to see what was separate from Woodruff Scientific as a fusion development company. So we, we span out Compact after the end of one of our SBIR Phase 2 awards primarily as a vehicle for IP and investment. In 2017, we started up Compact in Santa Fe. We relocated here uh, in June of 2017, and, and we engaged with one of the ARPA-E-supported projects. So this was the stabilized liner compressor. At the time, it seemed like a natural fit because I was working on a costing study for four of the ARPA-E-supported concepts, and the, the stabilized liner compressor seemed like it ticked all the boxes as far as uh, Compact was concerned. So we found seed investment last year. We found two New Mexico Small Business Assistance Awards to support scientists at uh, Sandia and Los Alamos uh, to help us move the design along. And, and we're just getting going. What are the advantages of this design and how does it work? I'll, I'll describe it two ways. So first for a lay audience and then, then for the tech heads amongst us. So the simplest way to convey it is that we're developing a, a fuel compression system that works much like a diesel engine. The fuel is compressed to ignition by a piston, and that piston operates in a cyclic manner at about 1 hertz. But unlike the diesel, there's no carbon dioxide produced, and the piston is actually made of, a, of liquid metal. Uh, further, there's no drive stroke per se. That means that when the fuel is burned, most of the liberated energy is carried by neutrons that are absorbed in the liquid piston and heated up, rather than doing any work on the piston itself. The hot liquid then is pumped to a heat exchanger to boil water and drive a steam turbine. So it's like a diesel in that there's a cyclic compression of the fuel to ignition, but there's no CO2 and the, the energy extraction mechanism is a little bit different. There's no drive stroke. So for the tech heads, um, we're aiming to capitalize on about 20 years of government research at uh, Air Force Research Labs and also at Los Alamos on the compression of field reverse configurations. The field reverse configurations are simply connected plasma rings. They're sort of meter scale. They're not, not much bigger than that usually. We're also going to draw on 40 years of development of liquid metal liner implosion systems, starting with Linus, the compressor originally developed by Peter Turchi at uh, Naval Research Lab. Peter is actually working with us on this currently. We've also got uh, Sandia and Los Alamos experts working closely with us on the design. Not only that, we've just won an award from ARPA-E 
to complete an engineering design of the prototype system. Uh, and we're going to be repurposing about a million dollars worth of equipment, cap switches, charging supplies, diagnostics, and so on from, uh, from Air Force uh, Research Lab. I mean, the, That's very exciting. It, 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 it is. I mean, we're just, we're just getting going. We're looking at space and uh, we're looking where we're going to put the equipment and build it out. What's different now from before is that we're relying now more so on some awesome computational tools. And these are running on supercomputers and the tools that we're running, the codes that we're running have all been used to model tokamak plasma. So they're, they're well benchmarked and we've got some good confidence that the, uh, that we'll understand how the system will perform. What are the advantages of the design pushed by compact fusion systems? Okay. So first and foremost, we're looking at putting enormous loads, both thermal and from neutrons on the first wall. A wall loading is, uh, is perhaps the biggest hurdle to any economic fusion system. So, you know, if you think about making your first wall out of metal, you know, that, that, that metal surface can only tolerate between one and five megawatts per meter squared. We're going to a liquid metal wall, and so we can go to almost an order of magnitude or maybe two orders of magnitude higher wall loading. And we don't worry about evaporating some of the wall material so much because it's replenished on each shot or in, or in each cycle. Next, we're using a plasma target that's a simply connected ring. We don't need any material down the center of the machine to keep it stable, and we can move the, the plasma ring from one location to another. We can form it in one region and, and move it into another region. So finally, the system is really very simple. We don't need any complex systems to maintain the plasma currents in steady state. It's all cyclic and uh, like I was saying, it operates much like a diesel. You mentioned Peter Turchi, who worked on the Linus project. Linus is a great example of a, of a technology that in, has inspired both your group and General Fusion. Can you talk about maybe some of the other backgrounds of the compact team and if you're an investor, who are they investing in? What is your team makeup? Right now we're, we're in the process of spinning out compact from Woodruff Scientific. It's likely to take another year for us to make that transition. So most of the technical team are, are at Woodruff, you know, so staff get paid through Woodruff and, uh, and the founders at compact are not really leaning on the investments that they've, that we've found so far. It's all going to support the technical talent at Woodruff. However, all the IP that we're developing is being assigned to Compact's, to Compact Fusion Systems. The core team of founders, though, for Compact are, as we were founded in 2017, are me, Ron Miller, and Peter Turchi. Like I say, we have a small number of angel investors and a small um, group of folk who are keen to help us out in the, in the scientific community. We haven't formalized the scientific advisory board just yet, but we'll be doing that as we get into the engineering design and we need input on one thing or another that, that will come in the future. But yeah, so we're a small technical team. There are a, bunch, there are a few of us with, with some business background and some business experience, but we're dominantly scientists. So what we're looking to do and to become investable, I think we need to build out the, the core team and engage others who may be able to help us move forwards um, and move forwards beyond the proof of principle. So once we've built our device and we've tested it and we're getting encouraging results, we're wanting to go to scale to engage with, with Sumble who can help us do that. Uh, so if I'm an investor, what, what should I know about your efforts and how would you go about pitching it to an investor or a strategic partner or a, an angel, for instance? Yeah, we've, we've not really pitched it. We might pitch it in the future, Maybe, maybe later this year. Right, right now we have a lot of technical work to do and there, there are many things to do to make the company investable. And that means that we need to move beyond the science and onto the engineering and for this to become a product development activity and recruiting the right people into the project to help us get to scale. Uh, we'd like to have customers involved in this discussion and we've re reached out to a number of different organizations to get input on what the ultimate product will look like. If I was to talk with investors right now, it would be to say that this is not really for the faint of heart. There are a lot of challenges ahead and some of these challenges shouldn't be supported by private capital at all. If we were to contrast with SciVista, here we have a company that's a natural candidate for venture capital. It already has a, a minimally viable product. We're already engaged with customers in licensing discussion and the, the technical development that we need to do to get to scale, to get to our uh, distributable app is only a year or two years away. But to contrast that with 
compact fusion systems. We're, we're still in the early days. We're nine months away from completing engineering designs and realistically at least three years from demonstrating an integrated test of all the major subsystems. So this, is, this really is a different sort of beast arguably with significantly uh, higher ROIs relative to an application, but we're taking the long-term view that we need government support for some aspects of the work. Compact would definitely benefit from the acceleration and focus that equity investment brings. In general, we think that the best approach is a public-private partnering with the government. This seems to be resonating right now with the Department of Energy and particularly with RPE. Yes, I think public-private partnerships are the way to go in terms of fusion funding because there is interest from the government side and there is interest from the private investor side. And if the risk is kind of spread between both communities and if the private sector brings in its business talent, it could be a win for these efforts. Question uh, number nine is when do you think we're going to have fusion power? Do you have any guesses on that sort of thing? I think sooner, now that we have uh, the wheels of industry turning on this problem. What I mean by that is that fusion has almost been this exclusively government-oriented or government-funded activity. And the government timelines and the scale that the government, the government thinks on are, are much longer and the, the amounts of money are much larger. And to, to be fair, there's been an enormous amount of progress being made in the government programs. You know, I, I certainly uh, originated from the Department of Energy program. But the, there is a natural transition that any technology makes from having government support to being supported by the private sector or being adopted by the private sector. If we were to look at the space industry as an example, we might get quite hopeful. And certainly, if you look at the cost reductions that have happened in private space enterprise and all the technological innovation that's happening right now in, uh, in space companies, you start to get an idea of what might happen for fusion enterprises. You know, it's certainly a very exciting time to be involved in fusion and, and particularly so in the private fusion activities. Interacting with the CEOs and the founders of all these different organizations is enormously energizing and very positive. The last question is, is there anything else that you want to add that we didn't cover, we didn't talk about something you want the general public to know about your efforts? Yeah, I'll just leave with this one comment. So if you study the history of internal combustion engines, you'll quickly see that there are a vast number of different types of engines that were developed, that were tried. Some were actually quite exotic. Uh, one of my favorites is the, uh, the rotary Wankel engine. And this really looks like something that should not work, but it's been used effectively in many places where conventional piston engines have not. My point here is that there will be many ways to reach fusion conditions, perhaps as many as there are types of internal combustion engines. There are many ideas to try out. Some will fail and very likely yeah, some will succeed.